Hi, I'm Cyril, co-founder and CEO of CTGT. We make software to make advanced AI like LLMs interpretable, especially for critical applications like finance and healthcare. Hi, today I'd like to talk to you about how we're opening the black box of AI at CTGT. Our platform empowers companies to rapidly deploy AI 10x faster and eliminate hallucinations in LLMs. First, let's start with a bit of background. AI is really unsustainable. Moore's law is the computing paradigm that has governed basically how much compute uh, increases year over year. So roughly, it's supposed to double every 18 months. CPUs have fallen a bit short of that in recent years, but GPUs have sort of helped out a little bit. The problem is AI has had a massive demand, and as you can see, there's quite a large gap there. It's 35x every 18 months. So we need a foundational new approach to AI to really bridge this gap. Moreover, we're seeing legislation come in from different parts of the world, including right here in California with SB 1047, that seeks to legislate what AI does, how it does it, and how it talks about controversial and potentially dangerous topics. Unfortunately, current solutions to give us insight into LLMs are really not adequate. In fact, uh, this method from a leading foundation model provider actually would take more compute to get all the concepts in the model and understand them than it took to train the foundation model, which is in the hundreds of millions of dollars. So this really puts it out of the reach of the vast majority of companies and people who should have insight into what AI is doing. So let's talk a bit about why this matters to us. Um, Trevor and I come from a deep learning background, and we've been immersed in machine learning research for a long time. My connection with this problem is personal. Uh, I come from an immigrant family, and my journey in AI really started um, at 11, when I actually uh, took my mother's college programming course. And, you know, I really saw the capacity that AI had to affect massive good and lift people up out of poverty, but I saw the other side of it. By the same virtue, um, I experienced a lot of issues with things like loan decisions, credit decisions that were basically made by a faceless algorithm, and I had really no recourse, um, and explanations were not really available. So I wanted to make sure that going forward in my work, these models, as they affect more of our lives, that we actually understand what they're doing. So let's go a bit about, um, about how, how our technology works. This is a traditional deep learning uh, model. You can, these are two classes. You can think of them as a cat and a dog. And the model basically tries to differentiate between these classes. It'll eventually get there, but um, it's hard to differentiate between those two circles. What we do is we look at it from this perspective, which is much more efficient. And then we can separate those classes, for example, the cat and the dog, much easier. That's how we can get the same performance as deep learning without the cost. So let's switch to our demo. Here's our platform, and let's say we're a financial company, and this chatbot is giving some advice to our customers. Let's ask for some advice. Okay, so what are some good investment strategies? Um, unfortunately, the model has suggested some dubious things, like uh, Theranos. So let's go ahead and see if we can fix that. Go to model health. Yeah, so this is our hallucination analysis uh, section. And what it's doing in the background is it's using our technology to test thousands, hundreds of thousands of, of potential queries that are problematic. And you can click any of these uh, in detail to control exactly what happens with the model and see an overview of what's actually been done. So let's go ahead and go back to the, uh, to the chat. Oh, you could go back to the demo, yeah. Thanks, yeah, back to the chat section. Let's see if that's fixed. Okay, yeah, so this response is more sensible. It talks about real estate now. So let's say you want deeper control of your model, not just eliminating hallucinations, you actually want control over the tone and cadence. Uh, for that, we can go to model health, and, or model steering, excuse me. And here, let's say, um, let's, let's select our financial knowledge, uh, yeah, knowledge base there. Let's just pick a llama model here. And we're gonna ask it to draft a, question, a email to shareholders about a Q3 results. Okay, there's an alert there, so let's go ahead and check that. And yeah, there's some risky language in there, so Trevor, why don't we 
Why don't we reduce that risk exposure like it recommends? OK, let's run it again. And yeah, that's better. Uh, as market conditions were challenging, our cost reduction initiatives talks about that. So it's exposing us to less risk, saving us from potentially pretty huge penalties. Great. Uh, let's switch back to the slides. Thanks, Trevor. So what does this actually do for our users? Well, we've saved them over 16,000 hours. We've been able to reduce actual model size by 98% because our technology is more efficient, great for deployment uh, on device like mobile. And like you just saw in the, in, the, um, in the demonstration, we're able to eliminate hallucinations by around 80 to 90% um, in actual deployment. Uh, we're really excited by the traction we've seen over the past three months when we've actually started positioning this to enterprises. Uh, we have nine enterprise pilots, three of which are Fortune 10 companies, and we're converting two of them uh, at an estimated ACV around 100K. And as of today, excited to announce that we're backed by YC. So we th really think the current deep learning status quo is untenable. We don't think we can just mindlessly throw more compute at these models. We think we need to think about this from the ground up and really go with the principles first perspective to understand what these models do and build them from the ground up to be interpretable and efficient. So if this sounds like something that's of interest to you, uh, scan that code there. That'll go to our website or go to ctgt.ai. Thank you. All right, thank you, CTGT. Judges. Great job, Cyril. Um, I'm curious if you can tell us about one of those um, enterprise cons customers that's converting. Can you walk us through where you first made contact with them, what the buying process has been like, and why you think, in a, se in a sentence, that they're um, converting? Yeah, you know, I think there's a deep need in for enterprises that are not, you know, the foundation model providers to actually have that missing last mile, right? There are these foundation models that exist, but these companies have different brands, they have different tones of voice, and they have different clientele. So that means that whatever training corpus that these big models use, that may not be appropriate for like a financial use case, um, a fraud detection use case, depending on your clientele. And so what we're seeing is they really hook us in in that last mile layer. And by deploying us there, they're able to um, either use their own models or API models. Um, and they can really imbue the models with their own tone of voice, uh, how their own agents would talk to their customers. And it really just makes the whole AI deployment uh, more seamless, more personalized, and actually hit their AI strategies uh, internally. I have a question on the product. Yes. And first off, thank you so much for walking us through this. Yeah. As the model landscape continues to evolve and models get better, how do you think about the durability of your product? Yeah, this is something that we think about um, quite a lot. You know, I think this really harkens back to how people are thinking about AI, right? There's this notion that if we just throw more compute at the problem, it'll sort of fix itself. But there's been very few times, if ever, in human history where just doing the same thing over and over actually leads to meaningful change, right? It actually takes radical reimagining um, of how we do it. And so I think approaching this from this principles first perspective, actually making sure that the computer science theory from our background is connected with practice rather than just you know, throwing more research at this problem, I think that's a tried and tested uh, practi uh, practical method of doing this that'll really help us stay ahead of these advancements. Um, and as I said, like the current state of the art interpretability methods would take uh, massive amounts of compute. So right now they're just not tenable for the vast majority of companies. Could you talk a little bit about the departments that you're landing in within an enterprise? I imagine this is yeah. useful across a lot of them, but there's probably a few that in particular are resonating with. We'd love to hear about that. Yeah, yeah. It's been really interesting as we hone in our ICP. That's been a very interesting process to sort of see um, what, what it resonates with the best. We're seeing a lot of interest with trust and safety teams, product teams. I think it's, you know, there's the actual ML team that does this base model layer, right? They're actually doing the fine tuning and whatnot but the gatekeepers of the model, so to speak, we're finding it resonates a lot with, right? Because who stands to lose the most from like an AI hallucinating, giving bad advice, um, doing things that it's not supposed to, right? Or in another tone of voice. Um, those are really the trust and safety product teams, uh, heads of like uh, VPs of product, trust and safety, things like that. So those are the teams that we're really seeing this product resonate with. Thank you. Yeah. Loved the demo, thought it was amazing. Thank uh, you on the reduction of model size by 98%. Love to know how you guys drive that. Yeah, so the plain and simple answer is um, deep learning is not the optimal way to learn. Um, 
And this is a radical thing, but we actually come from the birthplace of deep learning. Uh, Jeffrey Hinton, who I just talked with a while ago, um, he actually wrote the paper on backprop with Rummelhart um, in 1996, just at UCSD, a couple minutes away from where we did this research. And so we're very well steeped in the deep learning paradigm. But we don't think that that's really the way to get the true intelligence. Um, and so reducing that model size, that's actually because we've isolated uh, what makes deep learning tick, so to speak. And by doing that, we're able to get the same quality of actual performance without doing the compute. Um, so yeah. yeah. Yes? I'd love to um, dig deeper on that question. Yes. So what makes uh, deep learning tick? What makes deep learning tip is, uh, well, when you look at, a, let's say you're differentiating between a cat and a dog, right? What do you think of? You might think of like the whiskers of the cat, right? As a, as a feature, right? So that's what internally your brain uses, right? And so deep learning responsible for a wide variety of advancements in multiple fields, right? Like protein folding, computer vision, natural language processing, right? Wide variety of fields. This is really because it's able to extract these features. Never before has a computing paradigm been able to like what sort of model you throw at it, um, what sort of data you throw at it. Like this general neural network structure has been able to learn so much, right? That's really what makes it, that's what really what makes it exceptional. So this actual concept of feature learning is really the important part. And work from my lab, it's in the science paper, um, really has isolated that mechanism. And I worked um, at UCSD on basically turning that towards like an interpretability angle. Um, how do we actually convert that to something that's useful for enterprises, and this is sort of, this is how it came out of that. What's been the biggest learnings from the first couple of deployments you guys have done? I think it's that there's really something missing um, in that last mile layer, yeah. I think, you know, existing solutions are either, um, you can only do that with APIs. A, a lot of companies, this is interesting, so a lot of companies we found, no matter how big they are, they actually might prototype on API models, like foundation models, um, but then they use their own internal LLMs because the running cost is, is quite high of those. So when you move from that, uh, methods that only work on like those providers, you can't use them anymore. And so something like our method that's extensible, interpretable, and basically is modular, you can pick out what you want, um, that's a real boon for companies that are doing workflows like that. All right, give it up for CTGT.